Well, this morning, I'm going to talk about family code. And uh, this message is really, uh, I believe, is that, you know, God actually has an ordained structure for family. God has an ordained, he's a, he's a God of structure. If you read through the Bible, what you'll find is that there are certain structures and there are certain things that God puts in place and says, hey, if you want to live a great life, just actually apply this to it. Has anyone else found those structures? Has anyone else found those commands, those principles to live your life by? And I find when I start living my life by those things, blessing and favor follow. And so this morning I want to share for a moment on the family code. And uh, you can find this in the Bible and I'm going to be going through some scripture. But my question to you this morning is this, the question, this is a real deep theological question. I'm going to ask this question. And I want to know, if you're a family member right now, or you're planning on having a family, this is for you, this message. But this thing is, is, okay, who is driving your bus? How's that got to do with family? Everything. Like, honestly, you think about it. Who is driving the bus? Think about a family like this, is that you all get on a bus, and you're all going to a place. What I find in today's society right now in a lot of families is that it's normally the kids driving the bus. The adults are in the back having a good time or maybe not having a good time, depending on how good a driver the young one is. I don't know about you, but at the age of five or eight, uh, we had a family farm and I would love going to the family farm. Why? Because my grandparents would always let me drive the tractors. And I would love driving tractors. Why? Because I'm young. Why? Because a tractor is awesome. And why? Because a tractor can go anywhere. It can go through fences. It can go over railway lines. It can go through anything without stopping. But, but if I'm driving, it's going through anything. And this is the thing in life is that why would we entrust the direction of our family with young ones that haven't got the experience to drive us where we need to go as a family? Well, this is very deep this morning. But I think for some of us, we know that it's true. If we're not careful, we get married and we plan and then all of a sudden it's like, you know what, we should just have kids. And then all of a sudden the kids become the directing force of where we're going. But there's actually a code in which we should live. There's actually a structure in which we should live as a family. You know, The way in which we live, we can find, and you can read through Ephesians 5 and 6, talks about the structure of a family. But what I find is that within the structure of a family, and looking at it from a biblical model, the first thing we should have in place is God. Is that God should be the CEO, God should be the head, the center point of the family. If you look in Deuteronomy, it talks about this. It talks about, hey, we should not put any other idol above God. We should not put anything else above God. And you look in today's society and you look at some of the families and what you will find is that either career is there or relationships are there or children are there. And and when it comes to marriage, what you find is that they've put everything else above it except God. You know, church, if we're going to be believers and we're going to be followers of Christ and we're going to do family well and we're going to have the blessing of family upon us, we need to actually use the ordained structure in which God gives us within the Bible. The ordained structure is this, is put him first. If we want to solve every issue of life, then just put him first. And then work everything else around it. Take hold of his word, apply his word to us. Is that God should be given the headship of any union. And that's why within a Christian marriage, it's husband and wife coming together with God as the centerpiece. That's what it entails within the Bible. And so that when it entails that, it entails that they are co-equals. However, they have a defining role within themselves. You have God, then at the center you have the husband and wife, and then you have the children. It is the, the family code of how family is made up from a biblical sense. But if we have take a step back, 
What happens is that sometimes instead of having God, we'll put family, we'll put friends. And what I mean by family is extended family. Or then when it comes, we have God as a centerpiece, but then the husband and wife. But all of a sudden, if we're not careful, it can be the wife and the mother-in-law. Or the husband and the mother-in-law. You know, and all of a sudden it gets murky. It gets mixed up. But if you read through the scriptures, what it says that what a husband and wife, they come together, that they leave their family and they become their own. It doesn't mean that they don't associate with family. They still listen to wise counsel, but they come together under God and then as God is the CEO, they, they seek God, the direction for their life, and then they apply that to their life. Ephesians 6, verse 2 goes on and it talks about honor your father and mother. It talks to the kids now, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. If you read it, children, do what your parents tell you. This is only right. Honor your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it, namely, so that you will live well and have a long life. Who wants a long life? This is what I love about Father's Day. Why? Because we're honoring the fathers. We're, we're honoring the fathers of the house. We are called to honor. The, you mightn't agree with every decision. You mightn't agree with some of the things, but you're still called to honor. You can have honor without agreement. But we need to honor. And in today's society, it's pretty hard to honor those around us with a different opinion. And so my question to you today is that can you lay down some of you just so that you can honor those in your life? You might be distant from your father, but friend, how about you just honor him with a text anyway? So that you can have a long life. But that honor will only be shown by us to our kids. How do you impart that honor to the next generation? It's God's dynamic design for family. You know, I love how we serve a God of order. He is not God of chaos, but he's a God of structure. One of the quotes that I heard on the radio, it says this, it says, you can spoil your children and raise your grandchildren, or you can raise your children and spoil your grandchildren. And you see it time and time again. Friend, I'm going to be spoiling my grandchildren. I don't know about you, because I love it, because I'll spoil them and send them back to their parents. <laughs> and you know where I get that from? My parents. Because they spoil my kids, and then I've got to deal with it after. <laughs> but these are the things. It's what we have a resolve in our life right now. How are we going to apply these things? Proverbs 22, verse 6. It's train up your child in the way they should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I love this scripture because it says go. Friend, someone here needs to hear this today. We are raising them to go, <laughs> not stay. They've got to move out sometime, mums. Dads, it's quite easy. You know what? I'm measuring up for the pool room right now. You know what? I'm ready. They're out. They're gone. Like Maya's telling me, I'm getting a car soon. Well, okay, that's only three more years and you're out of here. Cool. This is all. Like, you know, these are the, but mum's like, no, you can stay as long as you want. Your husband can move in. No. <laughs> but, you know, they, but we've got to realize that we're not raising kids. We're raising adults. We're raising adults. Parenting is a process of teaching and training kids to leave. You know, and Carolina and I believe that we're not raising kids, we're raising adults. You know, these young ones, they're going to be contributors, not consumers. They're going to take responsibility. They're going to be grounded. They're going to be passionate and compassionate to those around them. Their yes will be their yes and their no will be their no. And they'll be a person of integrity. That's what we're raising. That's who we're raising. That's who we're raising. We're not raising kid adults here. And some of you are like, what's a kid adult? 
Well, look at the Urban Dictionary. It'll tell you exactly what they are. A kid adult is a grown-up that is also a kid. A fun-loving, nice, hyper-funny, slightly inappropriate person. Anyone know anyone like that? Inappropriate person sitting next to someone like that. Yes, okay. Some of the wives are like, yes, 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 yes. Ticks all the boxes. And they're super weird, to put it on. the. And they've got this thing called the Peter Pan syndrome. They never want to grow up. They never want to grow up. 30, 40-year-olds sitting there gaming all night and putting away responsibility instead of coming to a place and knowing when it needs to be in its place. We have a generation that live at home that have never moved out. And these are the things that we're looking at. They remain emotionally that of a teenager or even a child. You know, friend, I'm not raising a kid adult. I'm raising an adult that will contribute, that will move forward, that will shape culture for the future. Why? Because they're going to be working out where you're going to be living when you need to live somewhere. And so I want someone who knows where I want to live, in a nice house, in their house, using their pool, <laughs> eating their food. Oh, that's when I'm 90. Anyway, but this is what's going to happen. But, you know, we've got to realise they're going to shape our future. They're going to shape the future of society. And what do we want that to look like? We need to have the responsibility of when we raise these young ones of how we're going to shape their future, their outlook on life. To be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, my first point is this, it's going to take resolve. It's actually going to take resolve. It's, it's purposed. It's a course of action. Is that fathers, wives, mothers, we're going to have to have a resolve. Nehemiah 4 Verse 14, when they were building the wall around Jerusalem, it was a time where raiders would come and, and try to destroy them, try to distract them, and families were given certain areas that they would build around this city. And as they were there, if you read through the scriptures, it was like in one hand, they would have a trowel, they would have their working tools to build you know, the wall. On the other hand, they would have a sword to defend those from raiders and protect their family. And what we find is this it says, uh, Nehemiah is saying, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. You know, fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Friend, we have to fight. It, it might not be a natural, but it's a spiritual fight. We need to fight for those that we love. We need, we need to have purpose. We need to have resolve that this is who we are. This is what we stand for. You know, today, there are some of you here right now, is that right now you're in the fight for your life. You're in the fight for your marriage. You might be in the fight for your kids. You might be in the fight for your family, for your health, you know, for your home. But friend, what I want to say today is if you're in that fight, keep on fighting. If you're in that fight, stand up with resolve. If you're in that fight, don't lay down your sword. Don't lay down those things that you know that are true. But take hold. You know, there comes a time where, yeah, it will be easy, but then there comes a time where you just actually have to fight. You have to have a resolve. You know, if the devil can't attack you, he will try and get to you through your family. And this is what I find time and time again, is that the devil will try to attack you in certain areas, and when he fails in certain areas, he'll try another area. And then if he fails in that, he'll try another area. Then if he fails in that, he'll try, he'll keep coming at you. Friend, the Bible talks about it, there'll always be trouble, there'll always be those things that are coming, but it's how we stand. Life is never easy. But that's okay. It's how you tackle life. It's how you uh, tackle the, the challenges that come before you. And here it says, it says, stand. Stand and fight. Have a resolve. You know, today, men, fathers, spiritually before God, you know, we are all equal. 
but in terms of the practical organization of the family, we are called to lead our families and set the agenda for them. In other words, we're called to lead and cover our wives, cover our kids. If you read through the scriptures, it talks about the role of a husband. And, it, and a lot of people like to quote, you know, wives, submit to your husbands. And everyone loves that. But I, I love the guy part, because it says die. <laughs> die. If you actually want to read it properly, read that. All the men, and they're like, oh, wife, you've got to submit. Well, how about you die first, and then she'll be willing to submit. I think that's what needs to take place. Some of you are like, oh, how dare he say that. Anyway, but it's true. If you want to lead someone, you need to serve them first. If you want respect, if you want honor from someone, they need to know your heart. And we're not called to be dictators. We're not called to be, have dominion. And if you read through Genesis, you'll find that there is nowhere where it says humanity is to have you know, dictatorship over other humanity. It's called to have you know, ownership. It's called to have you know, rule over the things of the earth, over the land, but it never, ever once says humanity. But if you read through your Bible, it says we are called to serve. Husbands, we are called to die to ourselves and serve our family, serve our wives. There are going to be some things that you need to put down. There are going to be some things that you need to put aside for a certain season while you maintain and you speak into the life of your family. And then later on, you can pick it up when you have the time comes down to priorities. Proverbs 26, verse 12, where there is no vision, the people will perish. Friend, do you have a vision for your family? Do you have a purpose for your family? If you don't stand for anything, and the saying is, you, you'll fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And that is so true. Friend, what is it that you put in front of you? Don't let your family be robbed by the lack of vision that you have. Don't let them be robbed. The Bible clearly gives us a vision. It gives us a resolve. God is always first. God should be the center point. Joshua 24, verse 15, he says this. He makes this statement at the end. He says, hey, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is a time where he makes this statement for his whole family, but he challenges the people of Israel. And he says, hey, this day, choose who do you serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve God. It's okay if you don't have that resolve, that's fine. But this is my resolve. If you want to join this resolve, great. If you don't, that's okay. But you'll miss out on the blessing and favor that God has. Well, that's a bit harsh. Sorry. Sorry. It's just truth. When you start reading through the scriptures, you'll find this. It takes resolve. The second thing that I find is this. It, it, it has a standard. It takes resolve, but it also has a standard. I, I love this thing from Fields that he puts up, and I don't know if I've got it there. It says this. It says, never try to impress a woman, because if you do, she'll expect you keep that up or that standard for the rest of your life. Like, how many of us have fallen for that trap? <laughs> but I, I tell you what, we need to set a standard. Yeah. We need to have a standard. There needs to be a standard that is set. God calls us to a higher standard to live above reproach. You know, he says, hey, come as you are, but don't stay as you are. It's not a holy, it's, you know, it's a holy righteousness, not a self-righteousness. The standard that God calls us to set. You know, it's God's ways, not man's ways. You know, God promises prosperity and favor in return for our obedience. He promises those things. He promises those things for our obedience. He promises blessing and favor. You know, why do you think Tithers can live off 90% on 
what other people live off. Because it's a principle and it's a promise. God gives us a standard. He gives us principles. He gives us a manual. He gives us structure on how we should live life. And nothing new is ever really under the sun. If you read through the scriptures and then you read through a lot of academic books or you read through a lot of things and what you will find is a lot of it actually just comes from Proverbs, comes from Psalms. You look at today, quarantining, where does it come from? Look in the Bible, it's right there in Deuteronomy. Nothing's new under the sun. But it's whether we know the word of God and we want to apply the word of God to our lives. You know, what we give our children and what we do for our children is not as important as what we leave in our children. Fathers, what are you leaving in your children? This Father's Day, what are you leaving in your children? What are you investing into them that has eternal value? Are you imparting his standards into the next generation? Why? Because they're actually watching. Young ones are watching. It is amazing how much they are listening to what you speak about at home. It's amazing. Because honestly, I could say, hey, can you take out the bin? Four days later, that bin is still there. But all of a sudden, I could be talking about something. They're like, oh, what's that about? I'm like, you're watching TV down the other end of the house and you're still hearing me. <laughs> Better still, they're upstairs and they're in bed. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, it's nine o'clock at night. You know what? I'm going to reward myself. I'm going to have some Black Forest Cabri chocolate. <laughs> the thing's not even open and I've got four mouths right in front of me. They're, listening. They're watching. They know. What standard are we putting in their life? You know, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 to 9. Have we got it there? It says, write these commandments that I have given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside of your children. God's saying, hey, listen, these commands, these things that I'm giving you, these promises, these principles, you know what? Get them in your heart and then get them inside your children. Talk about them whenever you, wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the streets. Talk about them from time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your home and on the gates of your city. Parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, we're called to do this. We're purposed to do this. Taking hold of the promises of heaven, the foundations that God has put and imparting them into the next generation. And I, I've talked about the home, I've talked about the code of family but also too, friends of those that you associate with and grandparents. If you're a young adult here, you have a responsibility as well to enforce the family code, to enforce the ways of God. And if a parent, and this is what I love about Romy and Ben is that they're saying, hey, they're dedicated, but all of a sudden the family come together as a church family and we support the family unit. This is what I love about raising kids in the house. It's because it's, yeah, we're raising them, but also it's being reinforced and they're being loved upon and they've been shown the same values. Friend, we are called to see the next generation rise. Rise. We need to teach them diligently. And if you've been around Carolina and myself long enough, is that we have ways that we do it. We do it in the meal times, we do it in the drive times, we do it in the bedtime, we do it in the mornings. At meal times, when we sit around, we focus the discussion on teaching our kids. As teachers, that we establish core values as a family. 
That is that moment of where we sit around a dinner table. And friend, I know that there are a lot of families right now that have never sat around a dinner table. They sit around the TV. And then all of a sudden what takes place is the TV starts to define the young one instead of a healthy discussion of what's been taking place in their day. The drive time is that we talk on the road. It's an informal dialogue as a friend to help your children interpret life. How did you interpret your day? How did you go in your day? Bedtime is where you lie down, you, that intimate conversation with them. Is it where you're listening to their heart and they're listening to your heart and you can impart the things of the Spirit right there as you start to pray with them as they go to sleep, as you read the Bible. And Carolina right now is reading Fourth Dimension with our boys. And so she'll read the Fourth Dimension, Yongi Cho, and I'll read the Bible or the Bible with Jesse in that time. And then she'll go in and she'll read the Fourth Dimension or just Nani or, or something, the things that will stir their spirit. But then also, too, morning time, when you get up, it's a time where you encourage them ready for their day. You encourage them. You can't, but then all of a sudden, what you're doing is you're putting the foundations, you're training the young ones in the ways of God. Friend, it takes a resolve to do these things. It takes purpose. It takes time. It takes energy. But if we're going to see our young ones rise and become all that God's called them to be, we need to have a resolve. You and I need to have a resolve. Of what does God want our families to look like? Is he a priority? Is he a priority or is he just an add-on? But if he's a priority, the way that we shape our world, the way that we shape our family and how it directs, will determine where it ends up. So friend today, I want to encourage you that God has a code. He has a structure. And if we can imply these structures, how much better will the world look when we have young ones that are passionate for God, that have a foundation, that love God, love their neighbor, and actually want to see heaven come to earth in people's lives. For us to see the next generation grow up in the ways of God, it's going to take resolve. And it's going to take us setting an example, a standard in our families.